I'm going to. I see that it's recording. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the second Wacom Rights Anthology reading from Reconciliation, a collection of short stories, poetry, essays, and memoirs inspired by this year's Wacom Reads title, Washington Black by Essie Adugan. The readers today are just a sampling of the Wacom writers who were selected to be included in this year's anthology. Copies of Reconciliation and Washington Black can be purchased at villagebooks.com. And our very first reader today is Nancy Canyon leading us off with her piece entitled, The Call. Nancy, welcome. Thank you, Paul. The Call. Thighs press against the wheel, background, stomach muscles tighten, clay turns between your hands on a spinning bat, smooth walls thin, rise and narrow into what might become a mug for hot tea, a pitcher for syrup, or a vase for flowers. Your husband pots next to you. He grabs a one pound ball from the pyramid of balls stacked next to his wheel and slaps it onto the middle of the bat. He wets down the clay and begins to center the ball. In the background, the radio blares the rest of the story. On the dusty shelves by the door, pots in all stages await their next phase, dry and ready to fire, green and waiting to be trimmed, bisque and ready for glaze. Wax heats in an electric pan, the melting resists wafting a caramely scent into the earthy air. On the glazing table, small bags of cobalt oxide, iron oxide, and chromium dioxide gather dust, power, powdered chemicals that will melt into greens and browns and reds, running into creamy glaze. The phone rings. You get up from the wheel to answer. You turn down the radio and say hello. Hearing nothing but silence on the other end of the line, you stand there looking out the dusty window, receiver tucked between head and shoulder as you wipe the slurry from your hands with the clay stiffened towel. Again, you say, hello? The phone clicks, nothing. You shrug your shoulders and set the receiver down. Turning to your husband, you are about to tell him who you think might be have been on the other end of the line when the pot he's throwing unexpectedly twists and collapses. He hisses like when he does, doesn't like the soup you heat for lunch or the sandwich you slathered with too much mustard and not enough mayo to moisten the roast beef. Growling, he scrapes the clay off the bat and throws it in the slurry bucket next to the wheel. He grabs another ball from the pyramid and begins again. In the pottery studio the next day, the phone rings. You turn down the radio and answer. On the other end of the wire, a wide expanse of silence opens into nothingness. Within that nothingness, you hear breathing that you recognize. Even after so many years of estrangement, you feel it in your belly, a certainty that he has finally come back with his tail tucked between his legs. You move the jar of paintbrushes over a bit on the windowsill and see in the circle beneath clean brown wood. The phone goes dead. You return the receiver to the crater cradle and tell Jack that your father is trying to get a hold of you. And get this, you say, he doesn't even have the guts to say hello. Mm. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Boy, you, uh, you combine great visual and tactile uh, imagery with the uh, emotional punch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next reader today is Linda Conroy with her piece entitled, One Man, The Boy, The Shadow, The Light. Welcome, Linda. Hello, thank you. This is a poem and it's a cento, which means it's a poem made up from uh, phrases and lines from authors. And in, uh, so kind of like a collage, kind of like a writing collage and this one was put together, obviously, with lines from Essie Adugin's work, but also from three Black poets, Claudia Rankin, Nikki Finney, and Terence Hayes. And it's also say that it's, it's a persona point because it's written as if by a Black man. One man, the boy, the shadow, and the light. I was a black boy, only I had no future before me and little grace or mercy behind. 
I was young and terrified and confused, a boy without identity, a walking shadow. I knew what they were at once, two runaway slaves, the whites of their eyes, the tremble of their fingers, as if their very breath did not belong to them. What sort of mi a mistake a boy can make who has lived all his life among such people, never dared dream of freedom for himself. We take on faith the stories of our birth, a moral stain against us, crept up unseen behind, like a piece of broken off shadow. I grew more watchful, solitary, stared all around me, slack jawed like a simpleton. It's also true, the nature of what happens isn't fixed. It shifts and warps with the years. My life had been one thing wrenched off course. I was black skinned as disfigured inside as without. I felt no less alien and apart. As if a bird could grow without breaking its shell. It's true what the birds say, the shell is the first wall. Would you rather spend the rest of your eternity with your wild wings bewildering a cage? A black man stitches himself to earth, his hand an onyx butterfly on a purple bush it both fears and fancies. He does not turn for it, not then. He pays attention to his future, walking all the way, his sweetest dream, his map to heaven like a plain face asserting itself in a crowd. Just like the time, time before and the time, time ahead, someone is praying, someone is prey. Something in the metaphor of the bow, which is never close enough to see the arrow, the wire wound around the wound of feeling that burns a hole through life to cultivate dumbness. It's silence operating like lace, more delicate than the lace around this old woman's favorite sitting chair. I would freeze in the rope of light from the nearby window, gather all this light into myself to remember and to draw it in plain sight, to lo locate the self salvaged. I imagined my existence as a true and rightful part of the natural order, a testament to my contribution in the world, mark my passage through it, trying on happiness. There are several kinds of happiness. Thank you. All right, thank you, Linda. Combining those together just brings new meaning to them all and a deeper meaning to them. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Our next reader today is Cynthia French. And her piece is entitled, The Really Big One. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's really wonderful to be a part of such a gorgeous book. Um, so thank you for putting that together. Uh, this is a prose poem. Uh, the really big one. The petrified forest off the coast of Oregon pokes its treetops out of the water as proof that the shoreline used to be further out, proof that the water rested west of here. The scientists say that the really big one is coming. It has come before, they say, swallowed a whole island of people who only exist now in an anthropologist's notes and stories passed down from neighboring island people. The scientists say that the really big one could come next year or 20 years from now, most likely in February, most likely there will be little warning. You might notice a change in behavior of the animals, they say, but we will have no alarms, no way of running. The scientists say that when we do realize what's happening, we'll have about 20 minutes to prepare, 20 minutes to race out onto the highway to try to reach the mountains. Seattle will be crushed. The port washed away. The Space Needle pushed over. 
all those expensive condominiums like cardboard to a pet bulldog in a Godzilla costume. When I went home to visit my parents, my sister called and asked me if mom was crazy. Is mom crazy, she asked. With my mother listening, I replied simply, yes. My cousin came over with her daughter and we dragged my mother out to the, of the house to dinner. She was convinced we were being followed. She overheard the people in the next booth plotting to do something. The nervous couple obviously on a first date was eavesdropping on us. She would only speak in whispers. We tried to change the subject. I ordered another beer. In my journal, I wrote, every conversation with her reads like a goodbye letter. I saved what I could, pulled the blue dress from the garage sale pile, the one my father had made for her in China. I packed up the hand crocheted blanket, the teal one. She gave me an envelope full of copies of the house deed and insurance papers, a list of relatives I think I might have met at one time or another. Here, at the park between Bellingham and Fairhaven, I look out at the water. The blue sky opens like a page. I imagine the wind like Van Gogh's brush strokes curling around my face. If I concentrate hard enough, I can feel the heat of the sun and can sit here for a minute or two longer. It's that in between seasons time of year when you want so desperately to be outside, but it's not quite summer, especially on the water. But the water pulls at us, invites us to oogle her curves. We plant seeds that get blown inland. We build houses with large windows. We pretend that the scientists were wrong, ignore all the signs. We've done all we could. The ball is clearly no longer in my court. The blue dress is hanging in a closet in my second floor apartment. Surely that will save her from sinking too quickly. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Cynthia. That was powerful. Uh, thank you for the, the compliment as well on the cover. Uh, this year's cover was designed by Julie DeFore. I uh, just included her name in there. A big shout out to her. Uh, it's a beautiful book she's put together for us. Uh, our next reader today is Marla Morrow. Her piece is entitled, Between the Rays of Light. Welcome, Marla. Thank you. Between the Rays of Light. My date's lamentation sounds small inside the maroon classic Lincoln Continental's cavernous interior. You are comfort, I counter. Nobody will notice you, nor your shoes. I shift my weight on the ivory leather driver's seat as the cascading sun and my date's demeanor flare. Thanks a lot, Matt. That was an elephantine compliment, the usual. I'll take it along with a smoke if you've got a spare. I yank the pack of Turkish and domestic blend flaps from my blue blazer pocket and light two, then two at a time until they're gone. I wad the hollow pack's trademark camel, a churlish ungulate in my fist and shove its peevish temperament into the gate of my worn right loafer. My date seaside home, flanked by shaggy bark cedars, has disappeared in our smoke. I switch on the windshield wipers. Matt, turn those off, it's not raining. I know, they help me see the comfort that you wore, I banter. That polished lat's a kick. You said nobody would notice. 
I lied. I accelerate the windshield wipers from low to high. The rubber blades squeak across the dry glass. I relight the cigarette butt from the ashtray and share last puffs with my silent date. Our strict conversation isn't awkward, it's a familiarity and stokes unspoken apologies for the occasional jabs that distance us like ebb tide from shore. Our relationship is an outgoing and incoming flow. I straighten my white carnation boutonniere. Its pink tinted edges ruffle a failed erasher of boring, but a wrist corsage of our gardenias ornaments my date's forearm that lazes by my side. Our smoky mass is interrupted, slightly perfumed by gardenia tropicana. Shall we go to the dance? Only as friends, my date reminds. Yes, only as friends. I drive into the stretching shadows of abbreviated landscapes at Esquire dry cleaners. The parking lot is empty. I stream best friend by young thug. The volume rockets. Crows scrawl their winged irritation across the drowning sunlight. My left polished flat and my right scruffy loafer dance on the Lincoln's rubber floor mat. You're my best friend, Mac, my left shoe date confides, polished and bright. I know, you're my best friend. My right shoe date concurs, scruffy and worn. I drag on another camel cigarette butt. I rummage for the six rolls of winter green breath mints in the glove box to refresh my wheeze. I lock the Lincoln and as I shuffle toward my home's front door, the lull of gentle waves and the fragrance of shaggy bark cedars cradle me. Mom and dad will pretend to be asleep. Mom will stumble down the hall toward our marbleized bathroom as if she needs to void. She really wants to smell my masqueraded breath to forgive the original sin. Alcohol, cigarettes, wild ways. She knows I date myself and dance between the rays. She tells me shadows glorify the light and that both of us boys are good boys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. Drowning sunlight, I like that. Our next reader today is Janet Oakley, and her piece is entitled Reconciling Charlotte. Reconciling Charlotte. I hate spiders. No, let me state it better. I'm afraid of spiders. Maybe it was because when I was a second grader, a wolf spider bit me before I could shake it off my forearm. They are a dark, big, long-legged type you find in the Pennsylvania woods. I had nightmares after that, even in daylight. A photo of a tarantula in a textbook actually made me jump up and scream when I turned the page and saw it. Or maybe it was when, as a teen, I came back from swimming at YWCA camp and slipped a damp arm into my rib robe. I got bit by a little spider in the sleeve. I ran out buck naked out of my tent to get away from it. I always shook out my clothes after that ran far back, sat far back from the corner of the outhouse seat where a wolf spider lived. Never mind the cane spider that inhabited my closet when I was a student at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. 
about three to four inches in size, it would come out from the depths of the dark moldy space and get on its back legs, if spiders have them, and wave its front legs at me when I tried to retrieve a slipper. It made a chittering sound that was unnerving. If it was trying to tell me to scram, I got the message. I've been on the lookout for spiders ever since, which is curious why I didn't freak out recently when I nearly came nose to nose with a large, very plump spider on her web when I cleared away dead leaves from my hosta and rhododendron bush next to the house. My movements caused the web to tremble, making her flee up to one of its anchors on the house wall. I looked at her and she looked at me. I assumed she was a girl by the way she protected a gossamer packet near her. I stepped back, eased away to continue working in the side garden. She slowly came back down. I'm not going to be nice when one of those really big house spiders shows up in my bathroom sink or skitters across the floor. I have come to terms, however, with the idea that while spiders can't be in the house, they can be outside. Let them be. They have got their own God's work to do. I watched Charlotte for a while as she wove her plot to secure her next meal. I continued to work in the bark around the plants, cautious not to catch onto one of the silky angers as she had laid out. When I left, she returned to the safety of the wall where the large shingles were overlapping. I looked for her the next day, careful not to bump into her web, that she remade a little bit higher up. She was still there. And so it went. Through misty mornings and hot afternoons, I went by to see her and check on her progress. A big wind came one day, breaking limbs and knocking out power for half a day. After it passed, I went outside to look for Charlotte. She wasn't there. The nearly invisible web she had worked so diligently was gone. Like the spider in Charlotte's web, maybe her time had come along with the cooling weather. I will miss her. I don't think I could ever consider the thought of reaching out and letting Charlotte come down and walk across my hand. It would be too much. Yet for a brief time, I was reconciled. Thank you, Janet. Great. Uh, next up, we have uh, Maddie Patterson, and her piece is entitled A Jellyfish Wanders. Welcome, Maddie. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Okay. A Jellyfish Wanders. The tide pushes me further to the shallows. My milky white bell goes in and out. The surface is dark, yet I see light near, too. A school of silvery fish cloud through my tentacles and into the dark. I float closer to the shore. I feel no need to move, just float with the tide. The sun parts through the clouds above. A fuzzy blob of light appears on the surface. I turn to my side and gently drift upside down. Suddenly, I can see a dark, slender shape riveting the calm surface, coming towards me. Dark shapes on either side plunge into the water, causing bubbles to stream beside them, then are lifted out again, on and on until the dark slender shapes stop beside me. I turn my bell to the top and slowly bob to the surface. Two creatures are leaning out of the dark shape. One has an object flashing bright light at me. They make odd loud sounds and have long strands like tentacles from their heads. After a while, the slender object with the creature moves out of sight, and I am left alone again in the glassy open waters. I look out to the coming beach and turn, my tentacles propelling me out into the deep gray waters of the ocean. I swim through the long strands of swaying seaweed over sandy surfaces and stone-covered ocean plains. Finally, I reach the deep, dark blue waters all around me. No sound, just deep emptiness. I wonder to myself what the creatures were and the long slender shape. I start to dream about other lives in this vast world other than my own. I stretch out and drift into the endless blue. Boy, thank you, Maddie. That was great. I uh, 
I felt the feelings of a jellyfish. It's <laughs> good. Thank you, Maddie. Our next reader today is Harvey Schwartz, and his uh, work is entitled Circularity. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Circularity. My great-grandfather, a painter, owed a debt that he chose to repay in spite of warnings of an imminent pogrom. He was high up a ladder when the distinct sound of horse hoofs became the drumbeat that ended his life. My lineage traces back to priests in the Temple of Solomon. While a murky trail leads from there to the Ukraine, we were always outsiders, had to be innovative, always looking over our shoulders. Growing up, I was a Jewish kid in the Catholic neighborhood who just wanted to fit in. Why did I have to be different? I didn't realize that Grandpa Ben's blood was deep within me. His survival instinct honed for generations was strong. He escaped the Ukraine alone as a teen and found a way to America. He didn't speak a word of English. My life has been as improbable as the survival of my ancestors that gives me the luxury and freedom to write these words. I am part of the soft generation, living on a cushion of comfort provided by my parents' people who knew if Hitler won, I wouldn't be writing these words. Yet, I hear hoofbeats and see swastikas flying and an ex-president calling those carrying them very fine people. Grandpa Ben never talked about religion, but it was part of his life. He also never discussed his early years. He somehow learned carpentry, drove an old Chevy wagon. He spoke with a strong accent and was a bridge to a different place, a place where flags were more often the sign of oppressors as not. There is a term that Jews are the chosen ones. Perhaps this could be better described as ones who have been around the block a few times. Our history is long, our experience is unique. If I search deep within for a message, it's a suggestion to make the world a better place so that the next 5,781 years of the current Jewish calendar are better than the last. In other words, take the fear out of hoofbeats. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. That's a, that's a fine closing sentence for that. Thank you. Yeah. Our next reader today is Joseph Silverbears with his uh, piece entitled Fact-Finding Mission. Welcome, Joseph. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Um, so, when I was four, my parents thought it best I knew something, something that influenced my life in ways that I only later realized affected those around me more. It happened like this. Joey, you know that people have kids, my dad started. Um, yeah, that's obvious, I replied. Right, well, normally a mommy and a daddy have a child that is from them. Okay, I replied. Well, you, mommy and I, aren't related in that way. Instead of uh, mommy and I having you, we chose you out of all the different children. You're talking about blood relation, right? So you, mommy, and I are not related by blood. I questioned. Without missing a beat, a beat, he replied, no, but mommy and I aren't either. So none of us are related? By blood? No. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, there isn't one. We just wanted you to know, he explained. 
okay, if I'm not in trouble, can I go play? He chuckled and said I could. Around age 11, he sat me down again. I want to talk to you about your adoption, he started. Yeah, we already discussed this. I'm not related to you and you're not related to me. Yes, that's true. He paused for a second. But you're related to someone. He brought out a folder containing papers. He pulled one of them out, of, out and handed it to me. These are your adoption papers. They say who adopted you and who put you up for adoption. He handed the paper to me. Well, mostly. It has a name for my mother, but the other just, the other just says John Doe. I've seen enough TV to know that this is either a very unfortunate name, uh, the mother doesn't know who the father is, like on Jerry Springer, or that the father died before I was born. I, well, possibly, but you see the importance here, right? You have the name of your mother here, he pointed out. Yeah, I know. Is there anything else? Actually, yeah. You aren't going to say she's waiting for me in the hallway like this is, uh, like on this is your life, are you? No, he chuckled. You have something waiting for you at Child Protective Services. It's something that your birth mother wanted you to have, uh, but you won't be able to get it until you're an adult. So like, 16 when I can drive, 18 when the government can send me to war, or 21 when I can legally drink. Honestly, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, he said, deep in thought. Cool. Well, if there isn't anything else, please put these away so we don't lose them. Thanks, Dad. With that, I jumped up and ran out of the room. We're going to talk sometime about the amount of TV you're watching, he called after me. About a month after I turned 16, I called Child Protective Services. Dad was right. Their records show that there was something there, but I had to be 18 to get it. I hung up the phone and complained to my dad about seemingly random ages of an adult. He laughed and agreed, and <clears throat> they weren't really built for this kind of thing in mind. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Uh, Christina Silverbears with her uh, work entitled Sarah Jane. Okay. The reporter chirped news bites in the background as Sarah Jane sat in her car. She was three cars back from the window at Starbucks playing words with friends and her sparkly blue iPhone. The phone was a self reward for maintaining calm during those 40 days of chocolate free Lent. Her nails were her signature SC ballet slippers, just like the Queen, done every other Thursday by Martha at Tic Tacs, just as they had been for 22 years. Her wedding ring, the same age and weight as when her husband, the Reverend Matthew Roberts, first asked for her hand in marriage. He might have gained 30 pounds in the intervening years, but her bride price hadn't changed one bit. Sarah Jane didn't tan. She couldn't have tried. Her softly freckled skin was set off by the royal blue pantsuit to a pleasing, but never salacious effect. Her shoulder length brown hair kept back by the weight of the sunglasses riding high on her head. As the wife of a holy man, she needed always to be pleasant, smoothing, and practical. Appearances matter. At the window, she greeted the barista, Kimberly, by name. She commiserated with her about the recent loss of their favorite sports team and complimented her on her window display. Then, with her usual certainty of manner, Sarah Jane paid for her own order and the order of the vehicle behind her. She dropped a $20 bill, folded into an origami penguin, into Kimberly's hand and drove off. For two hours, Sarah Jane checked in on the women at the church shelter. She took notes on their little needs and she cheered them. She prayed with Prue, a woman lucky enough to have been born the same day JFK was assassinated and who until recent, recently was married to a man evil enough to have pulled the trigger. Prue's hand still shook whenever the children made a loud noise, but at least her eyes had stopped darting rhythmically. Progress. Sarah Jane ate lunch with Nigerian immigrants. They were very devout, like many from Africa, and were church shopping. She did her best to represent her husband's church. Amaya had teeth that shone with religious fervor and a smile that promised forgiveness and compassion. Her husband, Akuro, was the moon to the, her son. One almost forgot that he was there. And whenever she spoke with passion, you could see that he forgot himself. It was Amaya who would decide what church they ultimately joined, and Sarah Jane hoped honestly that it would be hers. After lunch, she checked in on some seniors of the flock, many of them members of the church generations deep. 
Mrs. Cassidy, 90 if she were a day, had the thick hands of a farm worker. Her bun was no longer streaked with white, but instead filled with the lightest filaments of white, occasionally interrupted by a drip of contrasting cream. In the early years of her marriage, Sarah Jane had feared Mrs. Cassidy, not physically, though perhaps there was still some of that left in the older woman's breadth of shoulder, but socially. Cassidy family had been here as long as anyone could remember, and as their matriarch, Mrs. Cassidy's voice had a lot of sway. I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Christina. Yay. I do miss having the applause in the readings gallery. I wish I could do that with all of the authors, but it is great to see the, the comments in the chat, the uh, compliments in there. Our next reader is Bob Zaslow, and his work is entitled My Soul to Keep. Uh, I'm unmuted now, yes? Yes, you're unmuted now. Good Thank to go. You. My soul to keep. Went to bed with a tight chest. Past April nights, I think nothing much. Maybe it's pollen or ragweed. But last night, I wondered, what if it's the first sign of the virus? I dreamed in shades of red and hellish fires, but this morning, the tightness was gone. <laughs> and my wife's cold coffee was spectacular. I thank God for my taste buds. I, I hadn't thanked God for a while. I noticed two cormorants on the lake glide a quarter mile, four inches from the surface and land like pro skiers after a downhill run. I watched the wind turn a stegosaurus cloud into a codfish and thought, that's God's animation. <laughs> I was so grateful to still have eyes to see with and a mind to make similes and metaphors. I listened to Miles Davis on vinyl and thank God again, this time for my ears. I remembered the story of a monk chased by a tiger seconds from falling off a cliff who reached for a strawberry and tasted it fully. Thank you. Oh, that was lovely, Bob. That was lovely, thank you. Uh, we do have another reader today, uh, Alexandra Lucas, and her work is entitled Cherry. Thank you, Alexandra. Hey there, thank you so much. Um, yep. So this is a, sh I'll read part of uh, my short story called Cherry. As a child, I often wondered why the cherry blossoms bled white in spring. To answer that question, my mother told me this story. When the grass still grew high and before the great war pelted the lands with iron rain, there lived a girl. Manon was not one for stories, but she surrounded herself with flowers and roots that whispered of years before her birth and of years to come long after she had returned to stardust. Unlike the others in her village, seduced by the cheap charm of progress, the raven-haired Manon had not grown too busy to listen. Each day she ran her palms over the tall grass, walked the 40 score steps to and from the village well, and tended her mother's cherry blossom orchard as she had dutifully promised many years ago. In times of worry, she absently thumbed a locket that contained faded portraits of her mother and father, the last traces of their likenesses in this realm. While Manon had long performed her tasks in solitude, she had just reached her 18th year when she realized that she no longer walked alone. A young man lingered ever in her shadow, his eyes wide in study of her solemn ritual. Her thumb worried over the locket more often then, until the day finally came when he asked her name. Manon, she said simply, returning to her work. This did not seem to satisfy the young man whose smooth hands were untarnished by toil or war. Do you not wish to know me, he pressed, lean, leaning so close that she nearly lost her footing among a tangle of peach tree roots. Do you not find me handsome? Menno studied him, recalling his face, strong and square, from a schoolroom long ago. Platinum hair tumbled to his shoulders, so thick and lustrous that he nearly ap appeared nearly pure, as if sent by her mother, the goddess. You remember me, then. I am Bastian, the duke's son. There is to be a ball. So will you be mine, fair Menno? 
the woman turned her eyes to her mother's cherry blossom orchard. Even if part of Manon longed for change, the sleeping buds would need their guardian through winter at least. I must water the trees. She closed the gate behind her. <laughs> for three days, the man asked her the same question, will you be mine? For three days, Manon said nothing, though part of her was quietly pleased by his persistence. On the fourth day, the man did not ask the same question. He did not ask any questions at all. On the fourth day, the man grabbed Manon so roughly that she dropped the tapered clay jar that she used to water her mother's orchard. The jar hit the ground, shattering into 100 upon 100 shards of memory. Manon pleaded for a moment to gather the remnants, but Bastion insisted that the jar was beyond repair. Soon after, Bastion dragged her to his father's tailor. Manon stood in silence as strangers measured and evaluated her again and again, although no one bothered to inform her of the purpose. The tailor complained when she fidgeted. She never met Bastion's gaze, though she knew he watched. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Alexandra. And thank you to all of our readers today. The, um, we actually, I don't know if you can see ever, all of the, uh, with the view that you have, but uh, I'd like for everybody to put their fingers together as a big cross of fingers that this time next year, when we do our Wacom Rights anthology reading, we'll be able to do it in, uh, in the readings gallery again. Um, I do want to thank all of the writers today, and I'm going to include again in a link on the chat that shows that you, uh, if you click through there, you can purchase copies of Reconciliation, today's anthology reading, and copies of Washington Black, and that Village Books donates a portion of each sale to Walk and Read's future programming. Thank you all, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful uh, Sunday afternoon, and I do encourage you to join us for Essie's uh, presentations later this week on March 4th and 5th. And uh, just to give you a little preview and a, a little uh, teaser to come, we're uh, gonna do something different this year. We're gonna be announcing next year's Wacom Rights theme at the same time that we're announcing the book. So you can get started early and uh, find some inspiration for a piece that you'd like to submit to next year's anthology. Thank you all and uh, have a lovely time and see you at Essie's events later this week. Thank you, bye-bye.